Okay, so um, this is our seventh meeting. Oh no, eighth, eighth meeting. A um, few things. Uh, we were at the Ohio Linux Fest over the weekend, so um, we were very busy with that. We actually didn't get a go through uh, the news, and I was had a plan to read a paper using Bro and SDN to modify traffic flow with uh, OpenFlow rules. However. Um, I was unable to find time to, to do that. So we're skipping that. We also have everything for signature selection. Uh, but we are going to go ahead and get started. And uh, this will be the first uh, hopefully successful meeting recording this week. We tried last time. However, um, we had an issue with the client and in the, the copy of the video wasn't successful. So I'm going to go ahead and give it away to, to Vlad. Vlad works at uh, Carnegie Mellon and is one of the Bro developers. And he will be talking about the Bro's logging framework. So go ahead and give it up. And then um, I got to ask you what is the demo on there. Yeah, I figure between that and Bro Live, I don't know if you have any PCAPs or anything in there. Uh, I have the BroCon 14 PCAPs on that. So if that's, that'll work for you? Yep. Okay, fine. cool. I'm glad. Um, uh, I guess the best way to describe my current status, I'm just doing kind of freelance pro work between development, sometimes I'm writing email, and um, a consultant for the International Computer Science Institute, where your pro is really You also aspire to come work for campus again? Aspire is one word. <laughs> uh, but um, this is, I guess, the, the first main talk that we've had on Bro getting into some of the frameworks and some of the details. And, um, there, there's kind of a lot of confusion as to what Bro is because there's some overloading of terminology. It's a programming language, it's a tool. Um, but one way that I think about it is just you have a bunch of network traffic that you're putting into this tool and it's essentially structuring the data and giving you almost a database view of what's going on in your network and is trying to extract the relevant bits and put them into the appropriate fields. Uh, so one of the, obviously whenever you want to work with that data, you need to deal with the logs that are being generated in one of your formats. Uh, those are being generated. So, um, Oh, I'm sorry. I, I messed that up. It's actually uh, islet.johnship.com. My fault. That is what? I thought it was pronounced islet. I don't know. Well, that's just for my phonetic. Uh, passwords demo. So anybody can follow along if they go to this address. This is software I wrote to help uh, improve training. I think that one still works. Uh, demo at Islet. Yeah, demo at Islet.johnship.com or Islet.johnship.com. Imagine people remotely can't hear. John, so I'm probably going to repeat something. No, they can. No, they can now. We got we got this working now. Okay, so. that's handy. Um, uh, I think you switched tabs. On I did. I was just retyping it. Okay. It's pretty oh, I gotcha. You can paste it into the GoToMeeting too if you want. Sure. Uh, other direction. Which configure are we going to use? Bro <laughs> Yep, number two, Bro uh, yeah. Passwords demo. Generally, run Bro on just live network traffic. You can also just give it a packet capture with the read file option here. 
Um, if I can just do bro dash r exercises bro con fourteen. Running exercises row count fourteen as so exercise traffic. Oh, um, that's my fault. <laughs> Let me try to fix that real quick. <laughs> Actually, just put those on there today. See if there's any other that are that are readable. Well, you did slash exercises, so just do it in the root there. There. Does that actually work? But the yeah, yeah there's the they don't have the file permissions. Five second. I don't have. I don't have pivot here a little bit. Here's your problem. This is uh, try.pro.org. Uh, there's another just learning utility where you can run some uh, run a script against a packet capture and just you see the results. Um, so the whole point of this script is just to print out some data. We're going to ignore that. But the main uh, thing to see here is just that you have a bunch of these stop loss files. Um, so kind of going back to that database analogy, these can really be thought of as separate tables in a database where they each have the same, each log will have a number of fields and it will just go through and populate um, for all those fields. So for example, in the column log here, um, we just have some information about the TCP IP connections. Uh, here's the timestamp when this happens, and here is the originating host, the responding host, the protocol, and so on. Uh, and then, you know, you can go through the HTTP where it has some of that data, some of that same data to begin with, and then has the MAC address and the IP that was assigned. Uh, and, and for example, here's known certs where whenever a borough sees a new SSL certificate, it will just give you some data about it, and I'll try to do that once per day per IP address by default. So you just have a repository of what are the SSL certs that I'm seeing. Um, this tells you the certificate issuer. So, hey, someone just got owned and their CA is compromised. Do I have any certs issued by that CA authority, certificate authority on my end? Um, so all these are just going through the, the logging framework. Um, and let me know whenever you need. Actually, I need you to drive. I, I was waiting because uh, I don't. I, 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 I need to so just do uh, open a new tab, terminal tab, and just type SSH test, and then you'll be in, on that host, and you can just chmod that uh, exercises directory should be uh, sudo su or whichever, however you want to do that, and then exercises. Do I need to set these Yeah, just chmod. Give them the uh, read the uh, readable bit. The whole, you can do the whole thing if you want. I don't really yeah. care. Yeah. Dash R. <coughs> fine. Uh, four 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 will work. But these are all. No, oh, I see. It's capital letter recursive. Yeah. 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 Seven four four will work. Or four 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 whatever. Seven 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 everything in the whole directory. And then yeah, just. Seven seven everything. Is there any seven fifty five? Well, the, the directory. Yeah, yeah, the directory is the pcap files are not. I'm just assuming they're not. Yo, seven 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 is cruise control for cool. That should do it. Pretty sure is cruise control. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, now can someone try that now? Uh, yes. I got just unless it's your permissions. Data layer. Data 
then. That's really strange. Um, <laughs> I apologize for that. I can't, even, uh, I can't even well, I can't do much <laughs> over here. I just got less yeah, missions than I had before. Okay, I, can't I, can't even even I can't even LS. Yeah. The, the, yeah. The That's a terrible damage. joke. I, I feel bad smiling at it. Can you, uh, there's still a fine dash type D exact change mod. What? A plus X? Yeah, of course. I don't remember it. I don't remember it. Yeah. <laughs> There's probably like multiple subdirectories. Rokan is. Oh, are these some different containers or something? Yeah, but it's mounted from the host, and should it should take effect immediately. All right. Um, yeah. There's the issue. Oh, I see the user ID. Yeah. Okay. Ownership looks like that very. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Vlad. I apologize for that. That's what I get for doing this right before the beat. So this is the same peak as I've been trying to throw, uh, just with some sample traffic. Um, so whenever you run bro with the read file option, the dash r, it'll just generate those logs in the directory. So is anyone that's following along having issues getting this running? Yes. Okay. I've got a new issue though. Right. It's progress, not perfection. I I'm lost. Like, what are we doing? I cannot open packet underscore filter dot. So um, thread. we're getting ready to uh, missing and aborted. Tor <laughs> Bro, we're reading in a few chapters. Yeah, it's got the same error. In the extra folder. Okay. Yeah. Now I've got some. So uh, if you're in the home directory, it's absolute path it. So you're on all the. Oh yeah. Uh, Pro dash r. Doesn't read on Lord slash exercises. Uh, yeah, because you can't write to that. That's exactly right. Either cannot open terminal. Or cannot or open terminal. Lord base r. And you're in the you're just in your home directory right now? No, right now I'm in exercises slash rocom. You can't write to that. You're directory. not gonna have write access, so go to your home directory. Just type CD. When yeah. you do the recursive or I don't know what the dash R flag is, but when you do the bro thing That's to read in a file. Read reading file. in, you read that sucker in, it creates a bunch of files in the directory that you're in at that point where your PWD. What directory are you in? Okay, so, so your home directory is right. Okay. But any other directory. So which one are we supposed to be reading right now? Or CD. Also. The one he has up there. SSL exercise traffic. That's just have all the things. It's all the just making everything. So maybe that's true. Yeah, I think, I think that's the clear. I'm still yeah. running that. Right, yeah. The follow-up is the solution. solution. Now I read okay, so right. now I've got all these files uh, in my, in my home directory. Well, uh, it's just a more general. Okay, that works. There you go. Yeah, just don't run it. I think we're probably going to have something working with these logs a bit more efficiently. Um, so you, uh, with, with these text logs known as the ASCII logs, uh, it's really just using the standard Linux tool suite of graph off, head tail. Um, one handy shortcut is just the last dash capital S, which will let you quit, let you move side to side because these are just really long log lines. Um, so all this should look very similar to the data that was on try.pro. Pro. Um, at the top here, we have some comments about this file. So these are all CSV files, uh, but they're actually tab delimited. Um, so the first thing is just what's the separator character. I just kept the left. Yep, sorry. Are you, uh, oh, you're lessing, OK. Yep. I was wondering how you got that so pretty. Yeah, it was just with the capital S for the turn off wrapping and like move side to side of the error. Um, and that has some information about the uh, the file that you're in, when the file is open. So this is uh, right now, and then it just has the names of the fields and then the type of each of these fields. So yes. <laughs> Uh, a time value, so it's just standard Linux epoch time. So the string, this is an IP address, this is a port number. Uh, and, and kind of just going through here. And then if you look at the end, it has a, a comment for when the, whenever the file is closed. Um, 
PHP kind of has the same few fields at the beginning. Um, and then MAC address, the IP address, how long that assignment is valid for. Not sure why you would have the release time here. Um, the release time would probably be a release. Those aren't logs. I mean, it should just be acts that are being Um, so going into how some of these files are actually being generated with the logging framework. So right now I'm on, uh, all the bro source code is up on GitHub, just slash bro slash bro. Um, and all these are being generated by bro scripts. Um, so the data is being made available to the scripts and other ones that one of the main uh, uses of the script is to take that data and generate logs. Uh, and that's really key because you can write your own scripts to create new logs, to add or remove fields to the logs, um, and that's really one of the main cust uh, customization points for working with Pro. Um, so scripts, base, protocols, you're looking at DCP, and all these have a main.pro script here. <coughs> Um, so these fields here, these all match directly what's in the um, So we have the TS value of the UID, the ID, um, MAC address, assigned IP, least time. Um, so essentially the way this works is you build this data type in Bro called a record which is really just a collection of other data types. So here we have uh, something named TS, which is a time value, which is a, of type time. We have something UID, which is a string. Um, we have ID, which is actually a, another record, so you can kind of nest these things deeper and deeper. Um, and the, the way it works is you'll go through and you'll populate these fields, and then you'll send, you'll just do a log dot write, and it'll go ahead and log that to the correct file. Um, Why is the ID the IP address? So the ID, if you look in the file, um, the way these are accessed in the ASCII logs is with this ID dot subfield. Huh. So here it's accessing origh, origp, rest base, rest base. So ID is actually a record made up of these four elements. Ah, okay. Um, so, and that just corresponds directly to the, the four elements here. Pretty much. Yeah, and you can kind of break it by making a record refer to itself in weird ways. So I think that was the second ball that took a while to track down. I bet I'd be good at this. <laughs> so, like, TS, UID, UID and ID are, are those our names that we're giving these? Yeah, so, so this script will go through and name these fields. So, you know, not only is this a collection of these other data types, but they have specific names and, and types associated with them. The type and time and string, those are like uh, keywords. Yeah, so one of the benefits of the Bro scripting language is that because it's designed to be domain specific for network monitoring, time value is built in, IP address is built in, uh, port is built in, so these just these kind of handy things that you need uh, to, to deal with. And then all these types can also have specific attributes. So uh, maybe you have something that's just for internal use that you don't want to clutter the log with, so you don't give it this ampersand log attribute. So whenever you send that record off to the logging framework, it won't actually break that into the log file. Uh, and similarly, some of most of these fields are required depending on what DHCP traffic we see. Specifically, maybe we don't catch the client's MAC address. I think according to the RFC, that's technically an optional field uh, in the one place we're looking for it. Um, and, you know, if they don't get an assigned IP address, if they don't get a, a lease, we're not going to have that information. Um, so essentially the, the process for building one of these logs um, is to this, this is essentially saying that there's a new DHCP log. 
uh, redef is just Bro's way of redefining a variable, and here we're essentially saying that we have all the log IDs that we know about, and we're adding this additional log to it. This is kind of a weird shorthand. Um, because we're in the DHT module, this will default to DHTP double colon. And then the logging framework will take that and figure out, oh, this is from the DHTP module, so I'm going to name it DHTP.log on disk. Um, I might name it something else if I'm sending it to SQLite or, or something else. <coughs> but within the logging framework, there are plugins for what you actually go ahead and name with those logs. Um, And then the other thing that's left is to actually just go ahead and create the, the log stream. Um, so Bro is event driven, all these events fire, and your scripts just have to have code in the different event paths. Um, so Bro init fire, fires on initialization and lets you just do things at startup. Um, and what we're doing here is we're creating a new log uh, with the DHT log that uh, we had above. We're telling it what are the columns in this log. And then there's a handy shortcut of uh, if I want to do something with this data as it's about to be written out to the logging framework, go ahead and fire off this other event and I can handle that somewhere else maybe to, to uh, and just get it as kind of a shortcut. So a lot of the code will just define this new event and then if you um, I, I guess I should back up a little bit, but so the DHP analyzer has uh, events for uh, a request, uh, an actual acknowledgement message, uh, NAC, uh, release, renew. So there's actually a bunch of separate events in there, and just to kind of shortcut you from having to sit there and figure out, well, if I want to catch a, a DHP lease assignment, I would need to handle this, this, and this. Um, a, a shorter way is usually you're just kind of going off of what you have in the log anyway saw something and you want to either act on that or maybe you want to send that to an additional log. Um, so just a, a shortcut is uh, this new event that gets generated of, hey, I'm writing this log to the log. Here's the data if you want to do anything additional. Uh, the other reason I, I kind of point out how this is actually generating the script is that this is really where the documentation is for all these different fields. Um, so if you know, maybe you don't know specifically what a trans ID is in the context of DHCP, um, this can uh, at least give you some clue of what's actually going on there and just a short description of what you're, what you're looking at. Um, here specifically, it's useful to start to figure out which portions were sent by the client, what was sent by the server. Yep. So, so you showed some code that seems, if you scroll down again, I don't remember where it was, but uh, not the Bronet. Okay, so here, like a DHCP acknowledge, right? Mm -hmm. So that seems to define a function that will handle DHCP acknowledge. I assume somewhere else this gets called when a packet comes through, correct? Yeah, so, so essentially there, there are two layers to this. There's a portion of Bro written in C++, and then there's the portion that is in the Bro scripting language that we're looking at now. Uh, so the, the C++ layer is really for all the things that need to be fast. Um, and that includes things like par actually parsing the traffic off the wire. Um, so there's C++ code that will take this and then it will uh, call this function uh, the, the DHCP act function. Um, and it will get go through and it will populate you know, the connection information, the IP address, um, and all these other things. And, these different events are documented. Uh, again, the, the docs are in the, in the code, but we also put those on the website. Um, and, and you can pivot around through there. Um, and then where, where the scripting layer comes in is that whenever you have this event, DHCP act header, uh, that code will run for every, every time that function gets called. Uh, so here we actually have it twice. Uh, and so does bro scripting language get compiled to object code? Um, no. So Glenn, it may help if you explain that. The, so the parser um, is written in, well, in this case, C++ yeah. for DHCP, and it defines events 
that when it parses the packets, it, it's providing both the event that it will fire and the data structures that map to that event. So here you're just catching that event and then doing something with the data it's providing you. So, so this isn't actually parsing the DHCP packet. Is so, it, so another way of mapping would be printed out? No, this is taking a parsed packet and allowing you to look at the fields of that packet and do something with or without Which it. Which is like unmatch action. Yeah, so this is so this is an event driven scripting language. Usually those are used in things like GUIs where you something fires at a mouse clicked at position X and Y. And you just have code that says when a mouse clicked to take the position and then do something. Uh -huh. Right. So this is kind of the same idea of we saw this message, here's the data out of that message, now I'm gonna go ahead and do uh, whatever additional processing I need to do on there. So the for the the the, scope, the goal of the C layer is just to literally pick out the, the fields off the wire, figure out the encoding or anything else that might be on there, and then just try to make them available, convert them to a address format. Um, I mean, I think here, yeah, some of the things were, so some of these are records, so we'll go through and populate those fields for you. Um, so uh, all this is really doing is creating a new local variable of type info, which was that record which we want to log out, and then it just goes through and it sets the different fields. So it sets the timestamp to network time. This is a function that will just return the timestamp on the last packet it receives. Um, ID and UID is already populated in this connection uh, variable. Um, and then it's really just kind of mapping up the data that we want to actually pull out. There's more data in here that we're not logging. Um, so as these get designed, there's always a trade off for how much do you want to log, how detailed do you want to be versus, you know, space considerations that is that really going to be useful to you down the line. Um, what I started touching on before was just the fact that, and uh, unfortunately this is quite wide, but uh, these events, you can also assign priorities to them. So you have two pieces of code that are going to get run whenever this DHCP act event fires. So you have this chunk here, and then because you're handling the same event further down, you have this chunk. Um, so you can mm -hmm. assign a specific attribute here where here it's priority five, here it's negative five, and it'll just go down and handle the higher number of priority things first. Uh, and that's really common for anything that gets logged out. And the idea is, again, if you want to maybe add fields or change the data before it actually gets logged out, you have between priority five and negative five, you can have another event hook that will do something. And it just lets you change that as opposed to, uh, you know, if this log write function call was right here, you just wouldn't have anywhere to actually insert your code. Uh, so the, the base scripts are just really designed to do the bare minimum, get you the logs, but they're really designed to be extensible in terms of you adding fields or changing the data somehow. Um, so, you know, maybe you wanted to, you have the MAC address here, maybe you wanted to actually have the, a table with the uh, with OID, the, the vendor name, um, so you could grab the first part of that MAC address, look it up, and you could add that to your log um, as, as you kind of go through and start extending that. Um, one other thing that Vlad didn't quite explain is those um, comments that are there above each of the text fields, you notice they have two hash marks in front of it. Yep. That's for the parsing of the automated doc, doc stuff. So cool. yeah. if you just put a single comment there, it's still a, or a single hash, it's still a comment, but it doesn't get parsed by the, by the parser. You guys running your own custom uh, parser or are you using some kind of product? It's a custom. Cool. Uh, I was just wondering. It's based off of Doxygen. I Doxygen. Cool. Uh, I, I don't work for Bro, yeah. by the way. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so all these scripts get out. documentation automatically generated for them. Uh, and so there's, there's a script index here that will just kind of go through all the different file packs. Uh, so you can go into base protocol of DHCP main.bro, and you know here's the DHCP info type. And it'll just go through and it'll pull all that data out. 
Uh, and then we were talking about the ID field, for example, which is really another record. So you could click on that, and that should take you to con ID, which shows you that, well, here are the subfields available in there. And you'll find uh, some things are much better documented than others. Yeah, there's still quite a few gaps, unfortunately. Um, and then, and then this is the new event that was created that you can handle this to if you want to access the data as it's done off of the logging framework and here's you, you'll get the CAC info uh, parameter. Something I've been meaning to ask, and maybe you know this answer, Vlad, is that documented somewhere? What your what all the different formats and, and cross refs are that you can do via the automated generation? I'm not sure. I looked at the source to figure it out. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Uh, I usually don't do anything all that fancy, to be honest. But because um, you can force references and stuff. Yeah, and there, there's special code in there for linking to an RFC, and stuff, uh, which is useful. Uh, it's almost kind of like markdown, isn't it? <laughs> Pretty much. Um, yeah, so this is an example of another log, also related to DHCP. So again, we have the known certs, where you just, just log the SSL cert once each time. This is known devices for, I want to know all the MAC addresses that are out on my network. Um, so this once per day, we'll just log the whenever the timestamp that it saw it, the MAC address, and then if it actually got a host name as an optional field in the DHCP message, it'll log it. That's always fun. It's always neat. Jim's iPad. Everybody's naming stuff with their first name all of a sudden. Uh, So, so on tradefro.org, there's a handy example here for creating a new log. Um, so this is just the, the same thing as, as was in DHCP, um, but it's really just kind of boiled down to the bare minimum where you're defining this new log. And really, again, this is the log, the full name. You have an info record, which has a timestamp and message. Um, and then you have, you're creating the stream. And here, there's just a little bit of code to just go ahead and do that once on initial uh, so this is the code to create uh, an instance of that record with the current time as the timestamp, and the message is just hello, um, and that matches up with time and string. Um, and then I'll just go ahead and write that to foo.log, and then I'll go ahead and print out log to std as the standard. So. I didn't give it a PCAP or anything, but just running this, it'll just have that one instance of this image. Uh, go ahead and run this with it. Well, so I wanted to see if there are any posts in this HTTP, but this interface isn't super great for that. Uh, I guess I can take a look at exercise tracker. Yeah, okay. so we have some post requests. Um, so, so an example of something we could do is we could just create a um, a new log for uh, maybe just a HTTP post request. You want to know where people are submitting forms, things like that. Um, so one of the main use cases is just for creating new logs. Um, so let me get here. All right. 
So here, we just need to pass it which log we're writing to and then the actual values that we're writing out. So we have the first log. So I'll rename this to the second Again, these, as long as I'm in the HP post, As I'm in this HP post module, all these are implied just to make it a bit more obvious what's going on. Um, explicit. Um, so I'll go ahead and write out this info record that I just, just try running that. So now we have an HP post log. It expects these things to be camel case, and they can kind of get weird with the naming. There's a way to override that. Uh, but it just has the timestamp and then the URI that we're actually going ahead and posting to, um, which is neat, but not all that useful really. Uh, so we can look at actually we can do this. I mentioned before that we have this utility event whenever something actually goes off to the logging framework. Uh, so we can do it says just look at this log HTTP event. Event. Oops. And then it'll just give me an HTTP info record. Uh, post over 
turn. And then uh, let's go to add in the host. Yeah, this is uh, the HTTP module, so it's actually good. More or less, I know there are lots of syntax oddities and weirdness, but uh, essentially just defining new log, defining the columns for that log, creating the file, and then go if you're in populate the field, then go ahead and write that out. Can we possibly, or do we have meaning notes for um, We can add some of those if you'd like. I think that would be useful to keep around as a reference for later. Okay. Uh, Vlad, do you care to? Copy and paste that to a text file or something, yeah. and then I'll add it later. Jesus, for these events, can you match on wildcard? Is the hypervisor? No, he needs to give it yeah, because it needs to know what for HTML, yeah. Specifically, I mean, I assume. Well, so I guess are you asking? Can you match like the event yeah. name? Eventually. Well, yeah. I just want like, so what if I wanted to only match on one field, itself. and I don't really care what the other fields are? Your function definition has to match for the event. Yeah, the parameters being passed in. Okay, so you just don't pass those parameters then? No, no, you have to accept all of them that are defined in the parser. But then you, you don't and actually you need to ignore the work result. Oh. And you can ignore, you don't need to use them, you can just ignore them. Okay, so you can, okay. But the signature needs to match. I got you. <clears throat> Another thing we can do is just start extending, because um, we can go back to DCP as an example. Um, maybe we want to just throw in an extra field in there. Um, so we have this DHP info record and some other data is available. Top level protocol analyzers. Add 
So I can do three to DNCP. And then here we're handling this DHP hack event at two different priorities. Uh, so what we can do is we can just have another handler in between those two. I'll just set this at priority zero. but I don't think we're actually seeing any Yeah, so it's annoying because these are in here because the RFC says they can be in here, but <laughs> for that, I don't think you actually see them all that often. Uh, Go back to the app list for a second. <laughs> Number XID would be at least different for each. Well, I thought those are already being logged as transactions. Mm -hmm. yeah, just oh, yeah. Well, you still 
login is another field though. Essentially, adding fields is just again redefining this record uh, and, and doing a plus equals with the new fields that you want, and then just going in and populating those. Um, I'm gonna add that to the notes too, which you had earlier. Yeah. Well, that'll work just there. It'll be fine. Yeah, I'm just kind of leading these up with tabs. Okay, cool. Um, So the other thing I want to touch on really quick. Is that log grid? Nope. And I don't know why. I'm not going <laughs> to. Yeah, it's still not, it's still not populating. I think it's because I'm just trying to override it when it's assigned to a connection. Technically, no, no, that was trying to say. Um, so going back to the yep. So I mentioned before that uh, these log these uh, log writers can also be plugins, and that's actually something new and pro in the upcoming release. Um, but a shared library. Um, so you don't need to recompile Bro to take advantage of new uh, new ways to send logs around. Um, so inside of Bro proper, uh, it comes with support for writing out to the ASCII log that we've been dealing with um, and to SQLite. So source logging writers. Um, so it has a SQLite writer and has this ASCII writer, and essentially you can go through and in your script and your configuration tell it where to send each of those logs. You can send them multiple places. Um, and then on top of that, there are plugins for sending it to data series, which is an HP binary format, which I think everybody had high hopes for, but hasn't really panned out that well. Uh, or you can send it to Elasticsearch, which is a NoSQL database. Um, that essentially takes JSON data over a HTTP API and then gives you JSON data back. And this is handy because it's, it's a lot more flexible than what you can work with since you can issue queries directly um, and then you just get JSON data back that plugs into uh, you know, D3 if you want to start graphing data directly in your browser or just it being a, a lot more easy to work with than the ASCII logs where you lose that uh, you know, at the top you have the, the name and the type, but you don't you use that whenever you actually go through and get the data. Um, so some people just use um, Logstash and, or just use Kibana, which is the front end to Elasticsearch for this data. Uh, that's how Brownian also works uh, using some of that data. Um, and really the, the configuration is um, I was probably going to move to something. Just like everything else, this has a script, and you can redefine these values to change how the logs will actually behave. So, 
uh, as you're sending these over to a database, it'll create um, essentially a, a database or a table or a database every X hours, and it'll change that out so you can query the, the correct data, at least in Elasticsearch analogs, which, does, which don't map quite the same. Um, you can exclude some logs, or you can explicitly send other logs over, uh, and it's essentially just in the logging framework creating a new filter um, saying that uh, for this uh, for this uh, stream that we created, go ahead and apply this filter, which will specify a specific writer that you should be using, and then each of those writers has um, a, a number of options. So here you can set the, the rotation interval. So you can actually have it where usually your connection log, your DNS log, or HTTP log are going to be the very noisy ones. So maybe those you want to be rotating every hour or two hours while DHCP maybe only once a day. So you can kind of tweak some of these settings to um, just to get some, some different behavior in here. Um, most places that end up running this will just load this script um, and then maybe they'll exclude a few logs that they don't want to send over to Elasticsearch. Um, but uh, the, the hope is that as you don't need to recompile Bro and keep version, or worry about um, version matching, matching and scripts changing, um, you, you can just kind of use these plugins and they shift with the scripts that they need and the customization points, they shift with unit tests, uh, and then you can just kind of go and enable them. So I think as we release this, we'll probably get more logging plugins for things like log directly. Splunk or whatever, and just kind of take advantage of the the extra benefits that, that you would get there. But yeah, so I mean, we, we focused on the on the ASCII log because that's what most people end up using. And really, if you're using one of the other plugins, you're probably just going to want to keep the ASCII logs around anyway, in case you know, your database goes down. Uh, in a few places, I, I have both Elasticsearch and ASCII. Enabled and people still prefer working with the ASCII log. It's slower, it's the tools that they're used to, and they can go through and correct. They don't need to use the mouse to click on things. I, I certainly understand that too. Uh, but yeah, you can just kind of tune it for your environment. But um, the the main tuning point is kind of stuff that we covered of creating new logs. There are people that uh, have a separate DNS log for external DNS servers. If you're not using the campus DNS servers or the company DNS servers, if you're going after Google, maybe you want to just have a separate file. Or um, you know, if you're doing DNS blocking, or bypassing that with that, um, it, it's probably not a lot of traffic. So go ahead and throw it in a separate file. You can just get separate statistics, um, and uh, and then just either adding or removing fields from the logs. Um, if you're doing HTTP basic auth, you're going to see the username and the password. Well, the username by default in the HTTP log. There are people that don't want that for privacy reasons. The logging framework does have some uh, customization points where you can actually remove fields and prevent them on uh, if, if you are worried about the, the privacy concerns on all the data that you're sending in there. That's pretty much what I have. Thanks a lot. Thank you. That concludes this meeting. Um, is there any topics you guys want to talk about for the next meeting? Any ideas? Um, I was interested in the sum stats framework. That was one thing that we could talk about. Um, we have a list on GitHub. I don't know how when the last time it's been updated uh, future topics, but um, let me quickly review that before we get out of here. I would uh, I would be in favor if if not next week then in at some point of um, 
utilizing the hypervisor to stand up an actual instance of Bro and using it to sniff something. Okay. I sure. think that I think that would be a worthwhile meeting. And right. just using the meeting time to actually do that. Oh, oh, yeah, sure, we can do that. I'm just also like interested in uh, the sum stats framework. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what'd you say, Shane? I was thinking we could maybe throw up the mini net or something. Ah, yeah. Just use our SDM stuff. That'd be cool too. Yeah. So we got all that to the note. So here's a few things we've talked about before. Um, of course, Brack, uh, well, I can do Brownian because uh, he wrote that. Um, we want to do the ELK stack. Um, we can take a talk about Splunk sometime in the future. A few things that were, uh, Tyler mentioned Wireshark. If you'd like to do some advanced Wireshark uh, yeah, stuff. Yeah, everyone knows basic Wireshark, but once you, you know. Right, yeah, we can, I, I can do that sometime in the future. Gui has lots of buttons. Well, maybe not everyone knows basic Wireshark. Uh, yeah, we can mm -hmm. incorporate it all in. Right. Mm -hmm. um, quickly, but yeah. Bad idea to hit the and the two other ones um, were Argus. And um, Snort. I know we talked about those two. Uh, a few people are interested in Snort too, because they've seen the Bro side of things, which is a different approach. We can also take a look at a strictly signature based system as well. We should do Suricata instead of. Oh, oh yes, oh, we can do Suricata. <coughs> that would be fine too. So. That's good. Right. Mm -hmm. You could also hack into the mainframe. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it with the name, I suppose. <laughs> All right. Well, that concludes. We'll, we'll figure it out. Um, so we have a bunch of ideas, and we'll, we'll come up with whatever works best. Um, Devin, do you have anything? You had your hand there for a second. I didn't know. Uh, uh, yeah. All right. Well, great. All right. Well, thanks for uh, attending, everyone. I appreciate it. And if you have any future um, ideas, throw them out. Let me know. And if you want to speak on something, please do. We all we need help. So we're ending early today. We are. Sushi. I'll try to make it more often. So. You want to come for sushi? I like to have you talk about some stuff you're working on too. So that'd be really cool. Yes, Tim. You guys volunteer me for all sorts of stuff. I know, it's kind of great. <laughs> Yeah, it was good. Yeah, yeah, it's good. 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 Yeah, it's good.